to another edition of Entertainment Talk with Claypool, where we invite guests from the entertainment world in television, film, and music. Today, we have a very unique uh, individual that I am so happy to have as my guest. It's a little bit different in the entertainment world. It's in the, um, I say, the arena of photography, but his skill set goes way, way, way beyond that. So I would like to introduce you to David Valdez. Um, David is, um, it's really a truly an honor to have you here because uh, I, you know, like we were talking earlier, I see you as a man with so much um, knowledge, experience, exposure um, in the world. Um, you have been to 75 countries. You've been to every state in the nation. Um, you have been personal photographer to Vice President uh, George H.W. Bush. You have held a very high role for Walt Disney World. Um, it's like um, you just have this um, special skill and talent to succeed in life. So I see you as a very successful man, and I see you as a man of great wisdom. But, you know, someplace you had to get started in all this. So um, I believe that you were uh, in the military. You was in the U.S. Air Force. And I think that's where you started your uh, career in photography, where you gained, started gaining knowledge or a like for it, or did you have a likeness for it before you even went into the military? Well, it's a funny story. So I graduated high school, and President Nixon wrote me a letter uh, in, yeah. inviting me to join the military. And, and so I went into the military. I got drafted. Yeah, I wouldn't, because my, my first thought was, well, wait a minute, did he, uh, wasn't the draft then? And he was yeah, trying to... Yeah, it was, it was like greetings. But that was <laughs> greetings, my, you're drafted. Yeah, but that was my, that was my first uh, interaction with the President of the United States, uh, uh, getting invited to join the military. And I, I went through basic training and uh, got out of basic training, got my orders, and they said, you're going to be a photographer. And I was in the 836 Combat Support Unit in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, they trained me as a photographer, and, and, and from 18 till, you know, 60-some decades, 60... 60 decades? You're year, really old. <laughs> years later... Um, uh, it became your life. It was my life. And, but and, you did not have any photography experience prior to military, correct? So, in, in my career, I wound up becoming the personal photographer to the President of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush. And I'm from Texas, and we, we were in San Antonio doing an event. And my parents invited uh, the White House staff over to their house for a barbecue. Uh, after we, we did an event, we did an interview with Larry King down, yeah. down on the uh, river walk. And, and uh, when that was over, my parents invited people over to their house for a barbecue. And, and uh, um, I'm like this hotshot guy, and here's all the White House staff. <laughs> And, and my mother says, well, hey, everybody, I have to show you something David did as a little boy. And I was like horrified. But she pulled out a photo album that I did as a little kid and wrote in crayon, pictures I've taken by David Valdez. And they were little snapshot, black and white snapshots that I shot you know, in the yard and, and playing with other kids. It's almost like you was like, prophesying over your own yeah. future or you you definitely yeah. had an interest ev evidently it, as a child yeah and and so I still have that photo album to this day and and uh, uh, so so I guess there was something there yeah long before I ever even thought about it but um, I also wanted to go to college and and the military paid for college and and uh, I was in the Air Force four years and when I got out um, uh, I'd been affiliated with the University of Maryland, and, and the University of Maryland helps the military uh, uh, people go to college. But and, you were, you uh, you know, before going in the military, you was uh, a Texan. You was uh, born and raised in Texas, right, correct? Right, right, right. Okay, and then you went to Maryland after military yeah, to do your college. Yeah, okay. yeah, and, uh, and so I, now I'm in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and, and I'm... 21, 22 years old, and I need a job. Well, the only thing I knew how to do was photography. Right. So, so I, I got hired by the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a photographer, and I'm photographing uh, the agricultural scientists and, and experiments they were doing. And I did a lot of portraits and 
and studio work. And uh, I was there just a year. And um, um, personnel guy came over and said uh, there, there was a promotion at housing and urban development. And so I went over there because this was federal civil service. So I, it, was, right. it was a gr yeah. great promotion. So I go there, and so now I'm I'm maybe 24, 25 years old, and I'm photographing uh, the the HUD secretary and and doing events at the White House, and FEMA was a part of uh, um, uh, HUD at the time, and and so I would travel the country and 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 photograph uh, disasters, still, mm. but still going to college, and and I finally got my degree in journalism and I thought well gee now I want to go I'm here in Washington and I want to go work for Time Magazine or the Washington Post and I started sending out resumes well I wound up sending a resume to Nations Business Magazine which was published by the US Chamber of Commerce okay and they hired me to be the chief photographer so uh, I was the chief photographer for Nations Business Magazine which was the number one selling business magazine in the nation. And uh, so now I'm photographing the presidents of um, General Motors and Coca-Cola and, and people like yeah. that and going up to Capitol Hill and photographing. You're already in a position that most people never even, you know, even see that world, so yeah, to speak of. Yeah, and so, so then one day, it was December 1983, I'm on an assignment to photograph uh, Barbara Bush, who was the wife of the vice president. And one of the press photographers told me that Vice President Bush's photographer left and got a job at Time Magazine. And I thought, well, that's my career path. There you so, go. So I'm going to apply. Well, it turned out that uh, most of the staff were Texans, and I'm a Texan. <laughs> and so that opened the door. It pays to be a Texan. <laughs> oh, amen, amen. And, and so um, Shirley Green was the press secretary, and that's where the um, um, uh, photographer worked out of the press office. And um, uh, it was a very light interview. Then I had to go back and interview with uh, Admiral Dan Murphy, who was the vice president's chief of staff. And, and he, beat, Interesting. he beat me up in the interview. And I, and I thought, oh man, this guy just hates me. So what do you mean he beat you up? He was pretty hard on his questions for he, you? He was tough. Challenging? On his, yeah, and he was pushing my buttons to see how I dealt under pressure. So when I left, I thought, this Interesting. Guy, it seems like a photographer you're you're basically behind a camera so you really don't interact a whole lot with people i wouldn't think but maybe i'm wrong well well there's a lot of pressure when you're working at the white house no matter what job you have oh yeah well, uh, be, i'm sure be, because you're exposed and in, especially in my case you i was exposed to extreme top secret stuff and 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 uh it was stuff that to this day i still can't talk about but uh, but imagine. but but uh, then after the interview with Admiral Murphy, um, uh, I got an interview with the Vice President of the United States, and it never really occurred to me that David Valdez from Alice, Texas, was going to go one on one meeting with the Vice President of the United no States, kidding. and and so I go in and he's very warm and and gracious and showing me around his office and. Uh, telling me, well, you're going to be with me in public and private, and and we have to have this trust relationship, and and I'm thinking to myself, you know, n nobody along these interviews has actually offered me a job, and no one's told me what the salary is, <laughs> so I had to ask. But just it, the position, you you uh, would, it's almost like yeah, that uh, is such a but you know, unbelievable you, position to you have. Know, you kind of want to know. So, oh yeah, so, right. So I asked. And he says, you know, I have no idea. Let's call Admiral Murphy. So he picks up the phone and he says, hey, Dan, I'm here with Dave Valdez. And he's asking me what the salary is. And I could hear him screaming through the phone saying, what? He's talking to you about salary? <laughs> well, they hired me anyway. <laughs> and, and my first day, literally the very first day on the job, they had gone down to um, uh, South Florida and... Uh, um, uh, I had to go through some clearance things and get yeah. checked in and all of that, and so I had to fly down there commercially, and and I was used to that because I'd been doing that at the Chamber of Commerce, flying all over the country. And, oh yeah, well if you've been and, to seventy-five countries and fifty uh, states, you yeah you've flown every which way. Yeah, so so I was like, yeah, I can I can I'll do that. So I go down to um, 
uh, Miami, and I get picked up by a White House advance guy, Hector Erostorsa, and and uh, uh, he was a great guy, Cuban American, and yeah. he, he comes up to me and says, "Well, let me carry your bags," and I was like, "Well, no, you know, I'm used to carrying my own bags. I don't know who you are," and and um, so he said he takes me to the hotel, and he says, "I'll pick you up at five o'clock in the morning." and I'll take you to the vice president. And uh, well, they were staying on an island off of uh, South Miami Beach. Uh, he was staying with a friend of his who built mm -hmm. the cigarette race boats and he loved to drive his race boats and-, and uh, Oh, down around the Keys? Or is uh, that where uh, they no, raced well, them at? This is in, in near Miami. His okay. Where his friend had an island. And, and uh, so I flew over there in a helicopter and, and I land and the vice president comes out to greet me and and I had literally gone through the interview with the press secretary, the, the chief of staff, and the vice president. So those are the only three people I knew. And he comes out to greet me and, and he says, well, come on in, I need to introduce you to Barbara Bush. And, and um, we go in and have breakfast. And uh, wow. so the three of us have breakfast. And then he says, look, we're, we're going up to Miami. I have to do an event. We're going to take the cigarette race boats and then he said why don't you get back in the helicopter and you take pictures of us from the helicopter well i'd been in the military as an air force photographer i'd flown in helicopters right. i'd taken pictures out of helicopters so it was like yeah this is been easy. there done that so to speak so so let's go <laughs> so we get up to miami and um we get into the hotel and his son jeb yeah. uh was there and and uh, jeb and his wife columba just had a baby jeb jr and and Jeb's bringing a little Jebby by for the very first time to meet his grandfather. And I'm in the hotel suite and there's Secret Service and staff and all these people. And Jeb comes in and he says, uh, well, I, I need to go meet with some people. And he says to his dad, can you watch Jebby? And and so he hands the baby to the vice president. And, and I, I noticed people were leaving uh, the suite, and, but nobody was saying anything to me. And, and in my mind, I was thinking, well, Yoshi Okamoto was the first uh, uh, personal photographer of the President of the United States for LBJ. LBJ was the first one to have personal photographer. And, and when you, oh, so, well, yeah, I was going to say there was that prior, but at some point there, there wasn't photography anyway, you know, you know, in the early presidents. Yeah, yeah, but, but a staff photographer of the photo President right. of the United States hired by the president and and uh, so Yoshi Okamoto did that and and there's great photos of LBJ uh, yeah. uh, you know holding up his dogs and with by the ears and showing his scar and, you know a lot of r really personal stuff so I thought well you know if Yoshi uh, could do that I'll just stay here and I'll take pictures and so the vice president goes into the bedroom he's playing with his kid and grandkid and I'm taking pictures in those days I was shooting film and the White House Communications Agency, WACA, would take the film and process and send me an 8x10 color proof sheet. And I would select photos and they would print them. And so we delivered some photos to Barbara Bush. And she wrote me a note and she said, I love the photos you took of uh, uh, Gampy and, and Jebby. As long as you take pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and do whatever you want to do. So that was my ticket. Oh, wow. So, so for six more years, I was... The vice president's photographer. And so you're you're almost like every day, right there with them. Almost. Well, I mean, well I'm it, sure there's it, certain things you're not allowed to be it, in on some, you know, certain. No, uh, it, it was 15 hours a day, but it was only seven days a week. And <laughs> and and, and uh, uh, one night uh, after he was elected president, but still vice president, so he's president elect. Correct. Uh, we were in Washington, D.C. at the National Geographic Society uh, doing an event, and we were getting in the motorcade to go back to the vice president's house, and he invited me to ride in the limo with him, and he offered me the job to be the president's photographer. So, um, Was you expecting that? I mean, since you had already been the photographer uh, as uh, him well, in, in the vice uh, president uh, role. You, you know, everybody told me that. Uh, don't worry, you got it. But until... The offer comes, right? And in, in the world of politics, and the salary, and the salary, yeah, <laughs> and it was a huge jump in salary, um, but but uh, uh, and it got brand new cameras, so it was great. 
Um, um, but, you know, in the world of uh, politics, anybody can look at you sideways one time and you're gone. Yeah. And, and, and so I was like, well, we'll see. And well, he offered me the job and I stayed on uh, for four more years. And, and uh, uh, when, when we lost the reelection, I wound up, now what? And and the now what was well I could go to Time or Newsweek or U.S. News and World Report and and but I having been inside the rope at the White House for so many years it was like I don't want to be the guy standing on the other side of the rope so I wrote a, a cold letter to the president of marketing for Walt Disney and I said this is who I am looking for a job and and uh, uh, he wrote back and said. Uh, uh, well, we don't have a job for you, but we're a creative company, and we'll create a position for you. Interesting. And so, d just out of uh, curiosity, is so um, as you know, um, he didn't. You know, President uh, George H. W. Bush didn't win the reelection, but you know, there's um, you know, there's things that follow that with the presidential library. There's a new um, president and vice president. So those weren't ever discussed as a opportunity for you, or I. I, w I guess everybody has their personal preferences, yeah, or yeah. somebody maybe that they've already got well, well, a relationship with. So, 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 uh, one of the tough things. Uh, so, Ronald Reagan's president for eight years. George Bush is his vice president. Correct. When George Bush is elected president, the Reagan staff, who had been there eight years, they all thought. Well, it's just the vice president becoming president. We need to stay here and take care of him. But the new president has his own staff, right? And and so, and and George Herbert Walker Bush was a, a very fiscally responsible, and he saw that the Reagan staff had gotten really big and fat and large, and he wanted to reduce the staff by 50%. Ooh. So all of us that came in with President Bush had to go to the existing staffs and reduce the staffs. Oh, and, wow. and that was not uh, one of the most pleasant things to have to do because they thought, well, gee, you know, we're all Republicans and and uh, you know we should stay because we we had the experience because he was and, uh, already in the basically the administration so yeah, to speak yeah and and uh, but that's the way they wanted it and so they reduced the staff and, understandable yeah. I had a quick question though is uh, so in in your role do you have your uh, an office in the white house or? oh yes yes uh, so so when i worked for the vice president i was in in the old executive office building which is uh, now called the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, uh, the vice president has three offices, uh, one on the U.S. Capitol because the vice president is president of the Senate, uh, the vice president has a ceremonial office in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, and George Bush had a office in the White House down the hall from from the Oval Office. When I became the president's photographer, uh, my office was almost directly below the Oval Office. When, when you go into the Oval Office, there's a couple of doors, and one goes out to the Rose Garden, one goes out into the front office, and through that door and into the cabinet room, there's another door that goes into the hallway that goes into the Roosevelt room, and, um, and there's another uh, door that goes into the, uh, a private little study and dining room off the Oval Office. Okay. And... Um, uh, uh, there's a stairway that goes down, and down the stairway at the bottom of the stairway was where my office was uh, when I was the president's photographer. So you just had to run up the stairs, and he wanted you close by. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, oh, we used to get uh, three schedules: uh, a, a monthly schedule, and on the monthly schedule it would say, well, a trip to London and Paris and Moscow and. Uh, maybe a trip to Ohio and, and California. And then you'd get a weekly schedule, which was a little tighter. And then every day you got a little booklet that was minute by minute of everything the president did, starting uh, every day with a CIA briefing. And, 
and you know Good he, grief. he was direct very uh, very uh, detailed and very uh, structured yeah yeah and he was director of the CIA and and when you think about George Herbert Walker Bush and his life and his career and and his build up to being president I mean he started out as the uh, uh, one of the youngest Navy fighter pilots in World War II. He was shot down in combat, right. uh, lost two of his crew members. He was rescued uh, by the USS Navy Finback, uh, spent like 60 days on the submarine, uh, finally gets out of the military, goes back home, and makes a decision to marry Barbara Bush and move to Midland, Texas, and go into the oil business. Now, his... Uh, uh, family, especially on Mrs. Bush's side, they were large, they did Red Book and, and, and all the major news magazines, and, mm -hmm. and they, he could have gone into that easily, but he wanted to go out on his own, so he moved to Midland, got uh, into the oil business, and uh, there was a fellow out in Texas called, uh, his name was Ross Perot. And, oh, yeah. And Ross I Perot. When Ross Perot ran for president. Yeah, well, Ross Perot wanted to hire him. And, uh, and he said, no, you know, I want to do this on my own. And, and so he did that uh, for a handful of years. And then uh, somebody said, well, you ought to run for Senate. And he, he ran and lost. And then they said, well, run for Congress. So he ran right. for Congress and won. And so now he's back. He's in Washington, D.C. And, um, and I can't remember it right off the top of my head. But, but he ultimately became, um, well, he was the congressman. And he was head of the Central Intelligence Agency. He was our ambassador to uh, the United Nations. He was our liaison to the People's Republic of China. He was chairman of the Republican National Committee. He was actually the person that had to go tell Richard Nixon he needed to resign. And mm. you, you can go to the Bush Library at College Station and see. He had a lot of preparation in yeah. molding him and yeah. preparing him for the presidency. And, and one of the big things that he did throughout his career uh, was interact with people uh, from around the world. And he would pick up the phone and he would say, hey, Maggie, Margaret Thatcher, how you doing? What's going on? Uh, how's Dennis, uh, 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 King Hussein? I mean, on and on and on and on. He would always do that. So when he was president and Iraq invaded Kuwait, yeah. uh, it was easy for him to pick up the phone and build a world coalition to remove Iraq from Kuwait, and and he put uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf in charge of that. Yeah, I remember and, that. And Norman Schwarzkopf uh, led the World Coalition in, 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 in a record amount of time. I think it was 60 days they removed Iraq from Kuwait. And I remember um, being in the Oval Office when Colin Powell, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, called uh, Norman Schwarzkopf and said, well, we've, su we've succeeded. And, uh, uh, you know, let's stop the war. And because there were these photos of, of the uh, Iraqi army retreating and just thousands of tanks and soldiers um, dead along this road. They called it the Highway of Death. Mm. And, and um, uh, so as you, uh, did you go to Kuwait for doing any so, of the photography? Or? Uh, well, so the former President Bush was invited by the Emir of Kuwait to thank him for saving his country. And the Emir sent his 747 uh, to Houston to pick up former President Bush, and I was invited to go on that trip. And we, we fly to Kuwait City, and um, uh, the mm. entire nation came out to greet him, and they were all waving the American flag and a little, like, fan with one of my photos on it. And, and uh, <laughs> you, you know, it was... It was it was a great incredible experience. No, oh, I bet. And um, but because um, um, that was that was one of the moments that I think that there's certain things in in your life that you know exactly where you were when something happened. So yeah. when we invaded Kuwait, I think a lot of people remember that that time in their life. If you know if they were you know uh, old enough you know to remember yeah. um because i remember that you know um, at that time i had you know moved to houston fairly recently was in an apartment watching it on television and cuz it was like just um shock and awe shock and awe to everybody yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, but it was it was it was a rapid uh um 
you know, process, and then it, it, it started and it ended fairly quickly. Yeah. So. Well, w while he was president, the Berlin Wall came down, and, and uh, his political advisor said, well, you need to go to Berlin, stand on the flag, stand on the wall, wave the flag and say, look, we won the Cold War. And he said, no, it's, it's not our victory, it's their victory. Let them celebrate. And he said in the Oval Office, if I go to Berlin and stand on the wall, some rogue Russian general will launch missiles. 30 years later, uh, I'm in Georgetown, Texas, and I go to a, uh, 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 a lecture from this uh, uh, missionary from yeah. the from the Ukraine, okay, and and he was in the Soviet military, and he's telling the story about the fall of the Berlin Wall, and he in his remarks, I'm in the room with four or five hundred people, and it, he, he this uh, missionary is saying, if President Bush had gone to Berlin, we probably would have launched missiles, and he said, I'm so proud of President Bush for not having gone to Berlin and being holding and restraining himself and, and, and the arrogance of victory. Um, and I've carried this photo wow. of, and well, the guy says, I've carried this photo of him in my wallet all these years. And he pulls out this photo and it's a photo I took. So I'm in the audience and I have to raise my hand and say, you're not gonna believe this, but I was in the Oval Office and the president said the exact same thing. And, and it was just, Incredible! Uh, ex Imagine that was—you probably could have heard a, heard a you know, a, a dime hit the floor because it was probably so silent with listening to that. Yeah, yeah, that's was, that's uh, impressive. That, that was that was really incredible. But but uh, uh, we went to Vice President Bush traveled to communist Poland and met with shipyard worker Lech Walesa, and, and Lech Walesa was moving, making a move against communism before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we went to Lech Walesa's house, and um, uh, and Lech Walesa said, "Someday you, George Bush, will be president of the United States. And someday Poland will be free." Well, that happened, and President Bush went back to Gdansk, Poland, and met with President Lech Walesa. And I was up on the stage with the two presidents um, as they were waving to the crowds, and and I got a photo of, of, that. Uh, of that, and it was. It was just uh, an incredible moment in history. Oh yeah, um, David, you have some. You know, I'm almost speechless. I'm not saying a whole <laughs> lot because your stories are just amazing. Because the history of of our our nation, you know, you have been basically um, a part of it, recording it in pictures. And um, I want to hear more, um, but we want to take a, just a quick little break so that uh, our sponsor can uh, um, that uh, supports our show, uh, we can take a break for them. Have you discovered the Toasted Yolk Cafe located at 14105 Ronald Reagan Boulevard in Cedar Park, Texas? Well, if you haven't, I would encourage you to come out and try our featured favorite Eggs Benedicts that we call the Arnold's. One of our favorites is the Southern Fried Arnold. Comes with two biscuit halves topped with two hand battered chicken tenders, two poached eggs, and covered with country sausage gravy. Or try the West Coast Arnold. It is two English muffin halves topped with Cajun turkey, bacon, tomato, guacamole, two poached eggs, and topped with Cholula ranch sauce. Or try the Alaskan Arnold. It's two English muffin halves topped with salmon, spinach, two poached eggs, eggs and holiday sauce and if that doesn't entice you try our southwestern arnold it comes with two english muffin halves topped with sausage onion jalapenos two poached eggs and queso sauce and last but not least the classic arnold formerly known as the benedict it is two english muffin halves topped with canadian bacon two poached eggs and holiday sauce all of our arnolds are served as a pair with your choice of hash brown casserole or grits the toasted yolk cafe at 14105 ronald reagan boulevard in cedar park texas where our slogan is it's never too early to get toasted at the toasted yolk cafe welcome back everybody we we are back and we are talking with David Valdez and what some amazing stories you have <laughs> shared thus far. 
And uh, we was just talking, and uh, you know, we think that this interview could probably go on for hours, but we do have a limit on our <laughs> on our show. Uh, but um, I wanted to share. I mean, just you know, not just the presidency that um, you was you know photographer for uh, Vice President George H. W. Bush, and who became president. Uh, but then you transitioned after the presidency, um, after George H. W. Bush wasn't reelected, you transitioned um, into a career with Walt Disney. But also, um, I wanted to read off uh, just some of the um, the national and international publications that your work has been in. I mean, you have had some of your work is in Life Magazine, Newsweek, Time, U.S. News, World Report, Forbes, uh, Paris Match, and People. Um, it, I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, so, you know, kind of tell us now a little bit about your career. How did you, you know, uh, you started sharing a little bit earlier and we kind of transitioned back to the presidency, your, your role there, but uh, how you uh, uh, became uh, involved with uh, Walt Disney, because it sounded like you were saying they, they wanted you so bad, they just created a position for you. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, it, that was a, you know, after the White House, what do you do? Right. And, and um, you probably feel like you've already reached your peak. Yeah, yeah. But Disney was an incredible, incredible experience, uh, and it was also in the world of photography uh, when I switched to digital photography. Kodak, that was actually going to be one of my questions yeah. because you know, technology it always advances and changes how we do things, yeah, and so. Yeah. You know, with your career, I'm sure that um, that was a, a change that you had to get acclimated to and adjusted to. Or did you embrace that um, right off the bat? Was that a, a little bit of a challenge for that transition from uh, to the digital world? Yeah. When, when I was at the White House, um, Kodak invited me to Rochester, New York, and mm. introduced me to the uh, Kodak Photo CD. And, and Kodak uh, actually invented digital photography but they didn't want to pursue it because they wanted to continue selling film and paper. They had a lot of money, and that was their business. And, and so, so um, uh, but it inspired me, and I said, well, gee, when he gets reelected, I'm, I'm going to make that switch. But we lost. And so I get down to Florida and, and uh, with the Walt Disney Company, and uh, the primary job was advertising photography. So we did the ads for Disney. And at Disney, uh, uh, we, we used to have these creative meetings, and, and they called it the Creative Cafe, and anybody could go. Right. And, and they'd say, well, you know, we're going to celebrate Mickey's birthday next year, and we're going to launch the Disney Cruise Lines. What are your thoughts? And, and they wanted the first thing to come out of your mouth. And, and they'd go around the room, and they'd gather up all this stuff, and, and uh, one of those would become reality in, in an ad or a parade ride or a show or something. Yeah. And um, um, I was kind of watching the development of, of digital photography and Disney had partnered with Pixar and Pixar came out with Toy Story, which was the first oh, yeah. digitally animated uh, film. Very successful one at that. Hugely successful. And I was looking at it and saying, well, look at that, the background. Look at those houses and, and the fences and the grass and, and all that stuff we could do that in our advertising. And, and so I went to my boss and I said, well, I, 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 in, in my hierarchy, I was in marketing and marketing, I was in, in, in advertising and advertising, I was in the creative group, and we created the ads. And I said, you know, is this I, nationally or yeah, is this yeah, globally? Yeah. Uh, well, Walt Disney's well, it's, got it's half Walt, a dozen locations, I yeah, believe. Yeah, it's Walt Disney Attractions. Okay. And, and, um, um, uh, we were we were getting ready to open up a new boardwalk resort in Florida, and I said I, I can build that building digitally, and 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 my boss said, well, give me an image or give me your job. So there was there, oh there, there, there was there was no pressure, uh, right? <laughs> and, and and so I pulled together a small team, it's three or four of us, and we sat down at a computer screen. We drew a little square, another little square, another little square skewed it and and we said well that's a row of windows and we went to the imagineers and got the blueprints and we knew 
what the roof looked like. We knew what the walls looked like. We knew what the rooms looked like. We knew where it was going to be. So we literally digitally started building it. But there were things that we could go photograph. But we, we had to decide what time of day, what's the light going to look like. So when we're creating other things, all the uh -huh. shadows, all the light matches. Very creative. And, and if you're down on the ground floor and you're looking up at the second floor, you're going to see the ceiling. So what's the ceiling fan in that second floor room look like? Because we have to make that look real too. And, and we did it. And then uh, we were successful with that project. So then at Disney, it was, if, if you can think of it, we can create it. And somebody said, well, you know, we need to think outside of the box. And the response was at Disney, there is no box. So, so whatever you can think of, anything, anything. Anything's a possibility. We can do it. And, and off we went. Now, I did have a couple of guys quit and say, uh, digital will never work. And then they wound up spending the next year paying for training to learn how to do it. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, they'd see me and be all embarrassed. But, but, yeah, because now pretty much every, everyone's got a digital camera on their phones. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's taken over the world, so Well, to speak. well you, you know, uh, I've, I've just kind of happened that I, uh, all through all my career, I've always been presented with Nikon cameras okay. uh, in the military and, and at the White House. And, uh, and uh, even at Disney, when I got there, they were using Nikon cameras. Uh, but my, my favorite camera is my iPhone. Really, and I I love my iPhone camera, and I. Do you think it's as uh, comparable to a Nikon as far as quality? Because uh, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. The you know, personally, I do um, you know auditions for acting, and I use my iPhone, yeah. and it just amazes me the quality that it, yeah. this phone has. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, so so, uh, just prior to COVID, I was doing the social media photos for Amtrak, so I was riding the Amtrak trains. And more than 50% of the photos I took for Amtrak were on my iPhone. Because uh, yeah. um, it was just, it, w it wasn't that it was easier, it was just kind of better. And, and it, was, Interesting. It, it was less intimidating, you know, to walk around on a train with, you know, with a big camera yeah. or, or just your iPhone. And and so so I think people are more comfortable with somebody holding an iPhone taking pictures. Yeah. Because it just seems like you're just... Yeah. Another person taking pictures yeah. versus if you have a professional yeah. um, large camera, it might be a little more intimidating to people. Yeah, yeah. Especially so, if they're in the lens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but um, uh, I'll never forget my very first assignment at Disney uh, was, was the National Teachers Award. And it was a big, huge black tie event. And there was dinner and Disney entertainment. And at the end of the event, people would walk into a room and there's – Mickey Mouse dressed in a tuxedo, and they'd say, oh, I get my picture with Mickey Mouse. And my head's kind of spinning because a few months earlier, people would walk into the room and say, oh, I get my picture with the President of the United States. And so that was, it was like, okay. Let's. You went from the President of the United States to a mouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From the White House to the Mouse House. Yeah, right. And, and, um, but, but, you know, at, at the White House with President Bush, we, we had so much fun traveling around the world. And <clears throat> no, excuse me. Um, the very first time we go to Kenny Bunkport, Maine, where their house was, he was yeah. wa he was walking me around the grounds, and um, we get down to the dock, and he said, "You know, as a little boy, I used to go swimming here." And he said, "You and I ought to do that." And I'm from South Texas, and I got my cameras, and it's like, hey, "That's the Atlantic Ocean. There's no way I want to jump in there." And he says, "No, nah, it'll be good." He said, "Look, I got a couple of swimsuits up at the house. Let's walk back up to the house." So we go up to his house, go into the bedroom, <laughs> we strip down, we put on the swimsuits, we walk back down, we get down to the dock, and he says, on the count of three, we'll jump. So one, two, three, I jumped, and he walked back to the house. <laughs> and, and, and so th and then it was like, okay, I got, yeah. I got this guy. Yeah. But, but um, you know, in the history of the United States, there's only been 12 people who've been the president's photographer. And of that group of 12, I'm number five. So it's a very unique position. Yeah. And, and at Disney, there's only been three people who have been uh, uh, head of the photography there, and I was number two there. So, uh, you know, it's yeah. 
pretty interesting. Uh, well, that's what, like I started out the show is it just you know it's it's very impressive your career because you're it's like you you've been at the top of your game everywhere. You know, of course it you know you didn't just landed. I mean, you had to pay your dues to get there, but um, uh, I think that uh, you had a um, a path that was almost ordained for you, so to speak, and well, you've well, done exceptionally well at it, it. it. You know, when people ask me, well, why, why you and how, yeah. just before the beginning of the first Gulf War, I found myself alone in the Oval Office uh, with a couple of other White House staff people. We were kind of looking around and said, you know, we're literally standing on that eagle in the rug in the Oval Office and said, we need to pray. And we prayed for the president, and we prayed for the military, and we prayed for the people of Kuwait. And, awesome. And, and I, th I think that moment was kind of the defining moment of everything. And, and when people ask me how or why, I tell them that. And, and uh, you know, it's probably true. Um, but uh, it's been fun to have interns along the way, and, and I was able to touch all these interns and say, well, this is how I do things, and this is how I treat people, and and I've watched them go on to be extremely successful in their careers, and that's a, a real blessing to have kind of that side sure. of, of, of the career. Seeing those that you have mentored, and, and uh, they rise up and, and, and go on to be successful in uh, a similar career path. Yeah. Not necessarily a you know, uh, uh, photographer, the president, but in, in uh, successful careers, careers in photography. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the, um, you know, you can tell that you're a people person, you're a person of compassion, and uh, um, um, that's something that um, um, is part of success, is being able to um, have a heart for people. Well, you know, these days, um, uh, I, I founded the Texas Photography Festival, Mm. And and I where's that at? In, where's it? It's in Georgetown. Georgetown. We're starting to do some pop up events around the state, and and I love it because I continue to learn from a lot of these people, and and it's great to meet new photographers, and you know may, maybe they're into nature photography or they do portraits or street photography or whatever they do, and and I invite and have featured photographers. And, and bring in speakers. Um, a friend of mine, Linda Nickel, uh, mm. brings in speakers, and, and uh, 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 we have a great time. And and I don't really do anything but just say, well, let's do this. Welcome. And and here's I got a group of people that helped me through the Williamson Museum, and uh, some core volunteers. Um, one of my volunteers, Julie Copenhavers, today in South Africa on a photography safari and and so it's, oh, it, so that's exciting yeah it, it's 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 great to have people like that uh supporting me on, on on that effort so you know even after all the things that i've done and and you know been published all over the world and yeah and, uh I, you know i'm still learning and still trying to share and and help other people grow i think that's you know what's amazing about photography and you have such an eye for it is just that it um, Any time that I think uh, with most people when they look at a photography, uh, a, a photograph, they wonder what, especially of people, like what is that person going through at this moment? What are they thinking about? Because uh, you capture the essence of human beings, the essence of history, the essence of, of, of humanity, so to speak. So um, you have a history of, of our history. Um, so it's it's very impressive how photography you know does that, and you continue, like you say, to to grow with that and and continue to capture it in different uh, formats, different genres of uh, photography, because uh, everyone has their um, is it um, I don't want to say I don't know if niche is the right word or not, but their specific interest, you know, and um, yours tends to be almost everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think about it, uh, you, you know, uh, you go out and see. A take a picture of a bird or a flower or something and mm -hmm. said, you know, I've always been paid, you know, I've always had a job right. doing photography, but I still enjoy that. Well, let me go take a picture of this flower 
because you know I see the beauty in that. Um, uh, I don't really do anything with it other than just the personal yeah. satisfaction. But but uh, right now I'm working on a, a portrait project, photographing veterans for the city of Georgetown, so we can honor veterans. And, and it's, oh, yeah. it's been kind of fun having. I've had generals come in and corporals come in, and and it's fun to uh, talk to those folks and share some war stories. And, and yeah. we had one guy the other day wanted to put on his uh, dress uniform but he had been shot up so much he couldn't put his coat on so we had to help him oh, get his heart. get his coat on but he's probably the best photo i took of the whole series and and uh, yeah it, you know those are the kind of interesting you know when you look at a picture of because uh, a picture tells you know pictures worth a thousand words as the saying goes yeah. So that's uh, that's a very good cause that you're doing there. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, and it's fun. Um, and, and then um, in my spare time, I'm chairman of the Georgetown Arts and Culture Board. We do spare art. Spare time? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you're, uh, <laughs> you're quite busy there, so. Yeah, but, but uh, um, you, you know, just some funny stories uh, uh, along the way. That one with uh, the president was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So, so back in the 80s, when he was vice president, we used to go just about every year, one of the Soviet leaders would pass away and we'd go to the funeral in Moscow. And, and uh, it was always like, you know, scary. And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, um, so you'd go into the Kremlin and, and you'd walk around the hallways and go to the new leader's office and I'd go in and take pictures and and um, uh, uh, the very first time we went um, it, it's a rectangle shaped office and you go in one door and so I'd always go in first I'd get, be ready to take the picture of the two people greeting and then you'd go back out that same door and and um, so I did that but they, the doctor and the Secret Service agent and the military aide, right. they had moved. So I said, well, I know my way out because we just walked in. So I'll just walk out. And I got lost inside the Kremlin. And, and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> so I'm walking around the Kremlin with all this camera gear. And... Um, uh, Sounds like a Mission Impossible thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there was this big giant painting of Lenin at the top of the stairway with this big red carpet and and uh, I knew when I got to that, that that was the door out and and so I get to the top of the stairway and I look down there's some KGB agents and and uh, and they were shocked to see me and I was scared to see them yeah and I thought well I, I, I'm gonna have to go down there so I'll just walk on down and I got down there and they didn't know what to do so I opened the door and and the motorcade right outside and I got in the limo and closed the door. Now I'm back in the United States, and and uh, so you they probably like uh, a sigh of relief. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, about 20, 30 minutes goes by, and and the Secret Service call and say, "Well, the KGB is looking for you." I thought, "Oh man, I'm on my way to <laughs> Siberia." So I go back in. And the top of the stairway was the dock and the military aid, and, and uh, they said, "Oh." We, can you come in here and take a picture of us in front of the painting of Lenin? And I was like, you guys, I, I was about ready to have a heart attack. And That's what they wanted was a picture? And, and you just want a happy snap. And I was like, oh, man. And, uh, uh, but, you know, stuff like that or, 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 or watching, um, you know, it's an atheist country. And, yeah. and um, uh, we were in the Kremlin with Gorbachev signing a nuclear arms agreement. And as we're walking out, we're walking down this hallway and Gorbachev stops and he says, wait a minute, I, I need to show the president this room over here. And we go down this other hallway and we get to this uh, these two big giant gold doors and he pushes them open and we walk in and it's the Tsar's chapel. So the 70 years of communism and, and they never touched the Tsar's chapel. They kept it there. And, and um, during one of the funerals, and I forget which leader it was, and drove off or one of them, um, uh, it's an open casket and it's a military processional in Red Square. 
and uh, just then they bury him there in the wall in the Kremlin. And, oh, interesting! And, and just before they close the casket, his wife makes the sign of the cross, and we're standing there with Margaret Thatcher and Yasser Arafat and Fidel Castro, and we're we're all seeing this, and I actually got a picture of it, and and it was like. Wow, uh, that, that's just amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, you never know what's in people's heart. Exactly. When, when George Bush was our liaison to the People's Republic of China long before I went to work for him, he was having a meeting with Mao, and 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 the, there was an interpreter, and and Mao says, "When I die and go to heaven." He says that in Chinese, and that's what the interpreter says. Now, who was this again? Mao. Uh, okay. He was the chairman of the Communist Party of People's Republic of China. And um, uh, so the George Bush, who was the ambassador, yes. uh, hears that, and then Mao changes it and says, no, I mean when I die. And so he, in his heart, was thinking when he dies he'll go to heaven. Yeah. But he couldn't, as the head of the Communist Party, say that, really. say that. Right. And so he corrected his what he said, and it's just that is phenomenal. Um, wild, David. Um, um, we are running out of time. Your stories are just phenomenal, and I, you know I may even invite you back for another <laughs> show and just pick up where we left off. Um, uh, because uh, I haven't said a whole lot because your your your, um, your stories just are so so interesting. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to close out our show. But I just want to personally say thank you for being my guest. Yeah, and this, uh, it you great. are it's great uh, um, it's a blessing for sure to uh, being here as my guest. You're a blessing to the services that you've provided uh, to the presidency, and you're a blessing to. I mean, millions, if not billions of people with the, um, I consider it entertainment um, that you've provided in your decades of photography. So with that, um, let's not forget, folks, that great it is to dream the dream when you stand in youth by the starry stream, but greater it is to fight life through and say at the end, the dream is true. We'll see you next time. <laughs>